with just what you're seeing in the background on my screen share right now, I'm kind of zooming in a little bit. So this is the end goal in mind. This is what you saw in the first video portion that we did. This is a family tree bow tie chart that I have done. And one of the objectives is besides having this lovely colorful family tree chart is being able to also put in a customizable background with your family tree. In this case, I chose a background that pertained to this particular family I was doing this research and family tree on. So I went to our local University of Texas at Arlington. I took this photograph of these trees in the fall with a picture of the science building in the background because the father of one of the central subjects in this family tree, the dad, his dad, used to be the dean of the College of Science here at UTA. So a pertinent related type of background image. And that's what we're aiming at. That's the overall goal. That's the reason why to use the software. What is it? It's called Legacy Family Tree is the software package. Um, you can download a free copy of Legacy Family Tree, also called Legacy 9. It comes from a company called Millennial Software. It costs free. You can download it for free. You can use it for free. And that free portion, I'm going to close this window and get back to the legacy family tree software. So when you load the software, which you can load for free, you can then load data into it as many generations as you want to for free, which are associated with photographs that you can see on the screen here. So an individual person's photograph. Um, all that is for free. The only thing that's limited down with that free version is the number of generations you can print on the resulting family tree chart. You can, with the free version of this, they limit it down to printing four generations. So the, the incentive, the reason why they limit you down, they want you to go ahead and pay $35 to obtain the full blown version, which I suggest you do. This is one of two software packages that are available commonly these days that allow you to customize the background of a family tree. The other one is called Ancestral Quest, which is in release number 16 right now. It also costs the same price, $35. You can get a free version of it. It's also limited down, but either one of these two packages can print a large family tree using a large plotting printer, one continuous piece of paper, no tape. Um, I suggest Legacy Family Tree. It has been in production, functioning, able to print with various artistic backgrounds that you can create or you can use their own default backgrounds. Um, that's been in production for about three to four years with that capability. The uh, Ancestral Quest is only functional that way for the last year. They, they began with that background printing in about the year 2019. Right now we are in June of the year 2020. So again, I don't work for Legacy Family Tree. I have used the software. I'm familiar with it. It functions very well and allows you to have this tree terrific variable background that you can use their own images or you can build your own images. I like that because you can have images that are pertinent to the family or the families that are merged together in the family tree that you are building. So how do you get the software? You go over to the internet and you go to Legacy Family Tree, just do a search through Google on Legacy Family Tree. You'll find their main website, which is spelled out LegacyFamilyTree.com. And on their website, you can go ahead over on the right-hand side and buy a full-up version for your $35. Or you can download the free version. There's an option here on the left. Somewhere it's kind of hard, there it is right there. 
try legacy 9.0 at no risk, standard edition is free, click here for details. So that's where you get their software. You go to this website and you have their software. So when you load their software, you're going to initially come up with no data on your screen. Right now, I have data here. I'm going to show you how to get rid of the data. We're going to delete this file. So right now I have a whole family tree built in this database. I only use this database as a tool myself, generally speaking. My genealogy files exist on another family genealogy database called Personal Ancestral File. That's where I keep most of my data. I have built professionally a few people's family trees exclusively in legacy family tree, but generally I just use it as a tool for printing. So once I'm done printing, and if I want a fresher set of data from my personal ancestral file, I will go up here and delete this existing data that you see on the screen right now. I'm gonna show you how you do that. So you go up to the file option on legacy family tree, you come over here one line down and you say delete file, and it says, are you sure you want to delete this current family tree and file? And you say, yes, and boom, you're gone. There, that's nothing. That's what you start with. Generally speaking, process will be that you already have your family database on Family Tree Maker or some other, maybe Ancestral Quest or Personal Ancestral File. You're going to import it into Legacy Family Tree. So here's how you do that import. You open up Legacy Family Tree, that's what we're staring at. You go to the import function. Hopefully you will have a GEDCOM file you, from your, let's see, Family Tree Maker. You would export your data from Family Tree Maker to a GEDCOM file, save it on your computer. Then you come here and you import that GEDCOM, Genealogical Data Communication file. In my case, I'm not importing a GEDCOM, but I'm doing something very similar. I'm importing my data directly from Personal Ancestral File, version five, or you can see here, you can also import from Ancestral Quest, which is that other type of genealogy system database that can also print. You can import from the Master Genealogist. So here is how the import works. I'm importing from Personal Ancestral File. I'm having Legacy create a list of files. It looks for my Personal Ancestral File database. It found it right there. I double click on it. It asks me to give it a name. I'll give it a name. There I have an existing name already. I'm gonna modify the end of it by just changing the date to today's date, today's the 16th. I'll just call it version seven. And at that time I open it and it comes in and says, you want to start the import. I just take the defaults that it has for the import, start the import. It depends on how many people you have in your family history database. This import phone function can take about a minute or two. So again, to reiterate, the, the reason I'm steering you towards this process is that you can create this lovely family tree chart that you might want as an end product for all your genealogy research. Gosh, I wanna have a chart I can put up on the wall in my house that looks really good. This will do it. Or you wanna give a family tree chart to one of your relatives as a gift for Christmas or their birthday or their anniversary. This will do it. You can come up with a beautiful family tree chart that is professionally done this way that you control the printing of. So there the import's complete. Click OK, and there's our family tree, our family data, excuse me, in Legacy Family Tree. This is myself. If you notice there's a red bar here, that means that's the primary person. So if I printed right now using the Legacy Charting software, which is up here on my toolbar, I would be the root person. I would be that starting person, and then my two parents would be above me, and then my four grandparents above them. So you want to learn how to find people and how to recenter, refocus to a central person within your database. What if you don't want it to be about you? You want it to be about a cousin. You're going to need to do two things that I'm about to mention to you. One is setting bookmarks. 
in that I am already highlighted here. I'm going to go to the bottom left of the screen and it says right click to set a bookmark. I'm going to right click there and there it now substitutes my name in on that bottom left hand line, Paul Francis Wilkinson. I'm a bookmark. I can click on that bookmark later and it'll take me back exactly to the screen. I want to do a family tree chart on that individual I showed you on that bow tie chart, Dan Gerardo. To find him, I could navigate through this. He's a distant cousin of mine, so he's in my family tree. And the way you navigate is you click on, maybe it's your parents, and maybe it's your grandparents, my dad's dad. So I click up there. And every time I click on another person, following up through a family tree, going back in parents or over to aunts and uncles, which is the bottom part of the, of the chart over here. Um, you can navigate to people, but it's a long route to get there. Whoever has the highlighted red bar is the central person at that time. Better to use the search function. So up in the top left side, you're gonna click on search. You bring up the search screen. You'll type in the person's name. In this case, I already have it typed in for my distant cousin, Dan Gerardo. I'm gonna click on find first. It will find him. That's him right there. He has the red bar. That means he's the central person now. And down at the bottom screen, I'm going to go in the middle, right click to set a bookmark. I'm gonna right click there. And now I've set a bookmark for my distant cousin, Daniel Gerardo. So him being now the focus, him being now the central person, we are now ready to go into reporting on this. The way you go into reporting is, I'm not gonna go into detail on the reporting right now, but the way you go into reporting is on the top toolbar, you have a reports tab. You can click on reports. There's a lot of different report options here, but we're going to go to legacy charting, which is over towards the right-hand side, about the center of the screen. It says legacy charting wall charts. That's going to print these large format family tree charts for you on that printer at the library. We're gonna show you how to get there eventually. This is the set of options that you get taken to when you first open legacy charting. There's different types of charts that you can print. There's ancestor charts, which are tree charts that can go sideways from yourself to your parents, to your grandparents going sideways. Going upwards instead, yourself being the root, your parents going up the tree, your grandparents further up the tree. That's what we're going to look at initially. There are other types of charts that you can also use here. There are fan charts, full fan, half fan, quarter fan. Each one of these has different benefits. Each one of them displays different family groupings in a better manner. The next set down, hourglass charts, which would show from a central person, one set of ancestors above, and another set of ancestors below. Um, you can have what they call a bow tie chart, which is shipped like a bow tie. It goes from the middle and it goes out further towards, further generations out towards the side. So anyway, here's how you get to all those charts. We're going to resume where we left off with uh, the software that is called Legacy Family Tree and their function within Legacy Family Tree, which is, as we saw back from their database on legacy charting. So this option on the top toolbar, we went to reports, we went to legacy charting and that opens up then a window on legacy charting. I wanted to start with, again, kind of an end product so you could see, oh, that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish. This is a deliverable. Um, this is a particular family tree I made about a year ago, back in 2019, for Mayor Elsie Odom of Arlington, Texas. It shows a few features of a custom background that can be created. The whole purpose, again, in, in doing this process is so that you can have an artistic background behind your family tree 
so, something that pertains to the subject of that family. In the case that you see here, I created my own background. It's a collage of photographs going back in family history from Mayor Elsie Odom and his wife. So I started with the family tree, which you see in the foreground, all the boxes and the lines. That's the mayor there. The mayor's wife is here. The mayor's daughter right here. And then I arranged photographs that pertain to his wife's side of the family up around here, his side of the family up and around here. Um, different features briefly. I discontinued using the major default heading that normally appears at the top center of Legacy Family Tree Chart. I created my own custom one down at the bottom. I added text descriptors to each of the photographs that I added in here. So you can add text in. Um, I added pictures of things as well as of people. And in the center where a family tree chart tends to get very dense and heavy with boxes and lines. I tried not to cover up people's faces too much with, with boxes. Um, one of the things that you can do with legacy family tree is you can move those boxes. So if you saw a series of boxes that covered up a, a set of text, or people's faces, you're able to, to relocate those boxes. Let's say that box up there, that's right over his face. I can actually pull it down and recenter it. So it doesn't seem that I'm being disrespectful to an individual. Um, and you can do that with any one of these boxes. That box right there is laying over the top of somebody's face. I can grab it and bring it down. Okay, and then I wanna match it over on the other side also. So the tool is very flexible and it's uh, good to be able to use various backgrounds. Using a custom background like this is a whole other chapter though. It involves obtaining photographs that pertain to that family. It involves using some sort of a graphics formatting extra program that you have to go into and prepare the background, adding text to it, adding different pictures, creating a collage, so to speak. That's a whole other lesson, a whole other chapter. Um, it involves using, in my case, I used uh, Microsoft Paint uh, 3D. Uh, you can use a free program that's called GIMP, G-I-M-P. That is a, a uh, free version of what is Adobe Photoshop, which is a real photo, uh, professional version of, of this to format pictures. In today's lesson, we're not going to go into formatting custom backgrounds. There are default background pictures that you can use within the legacy family tree that it comes with either built in to the software when you load the software in your computer and or also you can go over the internet to import a background image. And that's what we're going to end up doing in the, the case of, of this. We're going to end up going through the importing an image. Um, building your own, I think, is, is a strength and a worthwhile doing, but it's very complicated, uh, not to be discussed in this lesson. So right now I'm going to exit out of this example. We're going to reposition ourselves. I'm not gonna save this chart back to this. We're going to go back to a different family tree. So I'm going to close this one, file, close. I'm going to reopen a different legacy family tree database. And I don't know that I'm going to find that one. So let's just go back through that import function very briefly. Can't find my existing family tree. Hmm. Have legacy recreated. I don't know why it lost it just a moment ago, but that's not a big problem. Eight. Let's re-import. Reimporting, we can talk about different features that we'll be 
talking about here and dealing with while well, it's importing all these different families. So there's different types of charts that you can print using this wall charting feature, legacy charting. A lot of it deals with how many generations you're trying to print, how best to display that number of generations in a, in a small chart that won't cost you too much to print. The best chart for fitting the most people in the smallest place is a round chart, and it is called a fan chart. You can do a full round fan chart, which looks like a circle, yourself in the middle, each generation out goes one person to two people, the parents to four people, the grandparents, imports complete. So there I am. I'm going to set myself as that bookmark. I'm going to go and do a search for that cousin of myself, Dan Gerardo, find himself, and set him as my second bookmark here. And I'm going to use his family to go into a different format of one of these family trees. So a fan chart is one way. We're going to go to legacy charting here on the top line. Um, we can look at his family as a fan chart briefly. So there are fan charts over here on the left column. You'll see fan, full fan chart. We'll talk about ancestor charts upwards. That's the largest one. It'll cost you the most to print. We'll talk about hourglass and bow tie charts also. There's hourglass charts and there are bow tie charts. Hourglass is like an hourglass, it's big at the top, it comes to a narrow neck, yourself in the middle, and it goes bigger on the bottom. A bow tie chart is small in the middle and it gets larger as it goes out sideways like a bow tie. So we'll start first with a fan chart, though, and we can discuss some of the options to printing and formatting charts. So a full fan chart, double click. And there's the full fan chart on Dan Gerardo. This is him in the middle of the chart. His two parents, his dad on this side, his mother on that side. And then the next circle out, you have the four grandparents, his dad's two parents, his mother's two parents. This is called a fan chart. I'm going to zoom away from it so you can get the picture here. That's what a full fan chart looks like. It is in my way of looking at things, the way to get the most people printed, the most generations, in a displayable small footprint that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. If we look at two things here for size-wise, in the bottom right-hand corner, it gives us the size of what this would print currently. And by the way, right now, this is eight generations that I have contained. You can set the number of generations here. Fewer generations, the smaller the chart will get, the smaller the circle will get, and it'll print on the smaller set of paper. The more generations, the larger that circle gets, it takes up more paper. Bottom right-hand corner, you can see the size right now is 25 inches by 22 inches. So that tells you how large it's going to print on that printer at the library. The printer at the library defaults with paper that's 36 inches wide and however long you want it to be. You'll notice on the display chart on the top left that there's some dotted red lines on it. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. Each one of those is a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. You can print this at home on your local printer. It'll print out in sections on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, and then you can tape it together. I suggest that you do that, by the way, before you go to the library. So you can look at the chart and see if it is displaying everything you want it to, if there are gaps, where you've dropped out a person that you need to do further research on first, if the, you've chosen too many generations and you need to drop those down. So let's drop this down to six generations, for instance. And we can then zoom in down here on the bottom right. We're at 50% zoom right now. I can go to a plus and push this up to a 100% zoom, which is right there. This is actually the size that it'll print as it's currently formatted. I'm asking myself, can I read all that wording? If you try to cram too many people onto a chart, that outer ring can get where the font is so small you cannot read the writing, and that is a limitation. Again, a fan chart, beautiful display. Um, you can add a background image, set of pictures behind it, 
Um, you can change your colors here. Let's look at colors briefly, by the way, while we're here. Appearance, top color. You can choose existing color themes, or you can go down and build your own color. I might choose that color theme. It's a lighter set of colors. I might choose these bold colors up here. You can also use a gradient fill, which is that check mark. You can get different artistic slants on how you like to present this. Um, so colors, good to work with. Let's go with other charting options. I'm gonna click back on the home tab. Here I can change the full fan chart to a different method. Let's say I went to the upwards chart. Now, the fan chart was 17 by 22 inches as I currently have it. That's very small and affordable. They're gonna charge you about $7 for a linear foot to print. At the library, you're printing 22 inches wide by 17. You know, you're, you're, you're under two feet long. You're under two times $7. You're under $14 right there with that chart. If I go to the upwards chart, for the same number of generations, and I'm going to, I have a background here I'm going to remove right now, by the way. Appearance, background, I'm gonna remove that image. It doesn't pertain to Dan's chart. I'm gonna zoom away from this right now. And right now, back on the home button, it's at eight generations. With eight generations for Dan's chart, with this number of boxes spread out, it is 76 inches long by 33 inches wide. It'll still fit on the printer, Width-wise, it's still within that 36 inches. It's going to print 76 inches long on the roll, though. It's a considerably higher charge for you to print this. You can do a lot more artistic interpretation and variability with this. Again, you can see the 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper where the red dashed lines are. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sheets going across, nine times three, 27 total. That'd be a lot to print at home. Um, other options briefly about appearance that you can do, you can control the page border. So you can click on that and choose the border style that you want to use. Maybe you like that kind of a corner. We have that corner. You can choose other things, your box style. I want to use indented lines. You can do this for male and female or all. So we're gonna make them all that way. You can choose the line widths. I tend to like to make the line widths kind of a little bit more dense than it defaults to. So I might push it up to a 12. Sizing options is going to control the size of the box widths from left to right. I can go with a wider box. And I do that though, it also is going to extend the width of the whole chart down here in the bottom right hand side. You need to zoom in on the chart to see what that buys you. If it's giving you a bunch of blank space at the bottom of a box, you probably don't want that. At the same time, where there are people's pictures, that box width affects how that picture fits. So you're dealing with that generation width. It's the up and down spacing between generations. If we zoomed out of this and we looked at the total chart, if I saw that I had a lot of white space at the top and the bottom, I might want to stretch out the generation width to better utilize without popping it to a much wider chart. Um, the space between boxes, I can stretch it, stretch the space between boxes, not the box width itself, but the space between boxes to a wider spacing or a narrower spacing, thus controlling again the total size of your total format print and what you're gonna get charged for it. Um, over here on the right, title. You can show a title. You can have a title at the top of your box. You can type in the text right here as to what you wanna 
appear on the top, or you can choose not to have a title there if you build your own custom background. And you can then move a title wherever you want it to be. Another thing you need to see real briefly is within the insert tab here, you can insert a text box, speaking of titles, and you can type your own text there. So I could say Dan Gerardo's family tree. And that's the text that I want. And I could put this box anywhere I want it to be. It's right here at this moment. And right now the font is really small. So I can go into the text setting and I can bump that font up to a more viewable size and I can change the, the color of it and so forth. And we can better see the font that would go inside a text box. So, or we can delete a text box. So editing the text. Why that's not appearing here at this moment, I don't know. But nevertheless, you can add text boxes that way. I'm gonna delete the text box. Do you wanna delete it? Yes. You can add a picture also the same way. You can insert a picture and you can navigate to a picture pertaining to that family. And you can drop, instead of a picture in the background, this is more of a picture that would go in the, in the foreground. Um, so I have with his family, different kinds of pictures, maybe a picture of his wife and it's going to put a picture in and it's awfully small right now and there she is right there and i can move that picture wherever i want it to be so you can add text boxes with text you can add pictures in i'm going to delete the picture i don't want it there right now um so various options to control the formatting of the chart this format of chart I like, but it does tend to get large in a big hurry, especially if you add more generation, it gets very long. So there are trade-offs to using it. Um, one of the things I might show you, by the way, while we're here dealing with background is you can add your own images. Remember I said you can add images that come with the software. You can add images that come with, I'm going to go to, I hope, okay, legacy charting. There we go. So on the internet, you can, you can go to their legacy, www.legacycharting.com backgrounds, or just do a search on the word legacy charting all run together in the word backgrounds. You'll come up to here and you can see they have a background of a tree or a background of a lake or whatever have you, you can follow their directions. What they're allowing you to do is basically copy, utilize a, a picture that you can use as a background picture in their chart. So say that we took one of their pictures, we imported it. I tend to save pictures per family. I might save that picture as a background for this family set of data. I can select a picture for background. I can choose how it is fit on the frame. Um, you can center it, tile it, which I don't like to do. Um, center it and stretch it. Center it with no stretching, it's too small. Stretch to frame, which I tend to like. So it gives a more artistic impression. This is the simplest way to get a background picture. You can use, you can see a tree in this one. Um, you can use other tree images that are default background pictures also, and you can import those and use those as background. So again, one of the options, probably the reason why I'm suggesting that you use legacy family tree is again, being able to use a good artistic background. You can go out and take your own photographs with your camera, save it, import it in, and, and pull it in as a background 
to this. So something for you to consider doing. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, by the way, here, so we can see some individual data, because that's one of the things I haven't talked to you about yet. So within a box, right now it's zoomed in too high. I'm going to zoom it back out slightly. Um, I'm going to take color and don't use a gradient fill, so it's more easy to read. So right now, we have a name of a person, birth date, marriage date, death date, age. Box items up here under appearance, you can control the items that get included in this box. That's another option. Right here, everything that's checkmarked in this box is what's going to be included right now on every box for every person. You can uncheck them, you can remove them, and scoot them back off to the left option here. So I just removed age, for instance. Um, I have, right now I have name chosen, birth date, marriage date, death date, and picture. I just dropped age out. So if I okay it now, now age disappears off the bottom of those boxes. I tend to like age. I contacted Legacy Family Tree today, and I asked them I would like to have occupation in the box there. And they said, no can do. We don't put occupation in there. Even though they let you capture that data, they don't have a way of displaying it, which I think is kind of a shortcoming, but nevertheless. Um, here's an interesting um, issue, by the way, when you come to printing. Before you print with a certain background image, I've gone down here in the bottom right and I've zoomed to 100%. This is how it would actually come off in the printer. And before I would even take it to a printer, I'm looking at this image and the background image is what you call pixelated. You're seeing little squares. It's not a high enough resolution image. And if I printed this right now, it would print out rather with nice smooth lines of a background, you'd end up with these squares. That's not acceptable in my books. This is not a good background image. It's not a good high resolution image. So you'll want to tweak that. You'll want to make sure that your background images have the right resolution. I'm going to remove this background picture for right now, and I'm gonna to go to a different format. So we're gonna go back to home. I wanted to show you another option. So this is your hourglass chart right here. An hourglass chart shows the ancestors before, above, so Dan's ancestors going up above Dan this way. So his dad and his dad's ancestors going up and his mother and his mother ancestors. And then below Dan and his wife, you see their three children. So the number of descendants underneath, I could add more generations of descendants using a top toolbar here. So I'm gonna reduce my number of ancestors this way. Okay, makes it more manageable. I'm going to increase, increase the number of descendants maybe this way to three generations. They don't have any grandchildren yet, so it doesn't show. So that's how you control an hourglass. That's the function of an hourglass. It shows ancestors going up. It shows descendants going down. Another type of chart that's kind of similar, but it goes sideways, is called your bow tie chart. So we're going right now from a hourglass chart over to a bow tie chart. This is getting back to the original that I showed you and we printed in the makerspace. So here we have Dan and his wife and his three children underneath this way. And then off to the left of Dan is his ancestors and off to the right of his wife are her ancestors. This is a background picture that I took. And if I zoom in to 100% on this, boom, there's 100%, and I come down to a text box, you can see in this case that you don't see any of those jagged lines too much. You see just a tiny little bit along the edges of the limbs, but it's not overly pronounced. Again, my own photograph that I took, there's no fear of violating anybody's copyright with this. People's pictures inside the boxes came from the family tree 
Legacy Family Tree Genealogy Database, this screen, those are those pictures of people that are inside the boxes in the chart. The background picture is what I added later on. Um, one last thing to mention about that background image before I disappear, I forgot to mention it, under appearance for background, if I don't want it to be so bright, I can gray it back by sliding this backwards. And it makes that background image not so prominent. So now the boxes appear more bold against that dimmer background. So that covers that much, I think, important. Um, once you've gotten it formatted and you've moved things around like you want to move things around, then you're going to want to bring it to the library. And you do that by saving it to a thumb drive on your computer, your USB drive. How do you do that? Up on the top line menu tools, you have publish. Go to publish, go to export to file, choose PDF for a file format, portable document format. This is what you would usually read in Adobe Acrobat. This is the format that's most commonly readable by most print shops that you would go to. You know, your Staples, um, your Bird's printing in downtown Arlington, your printing at the library. Of course, you can export it in other formats too. The library um, printer there in the makerspace can print JPEG or BMP, but the most common format to print in and to carry forward is a PDF format. Um, you can go ahead and save it to your computer. I usually save it in that family's genealogy folder. And then I move a copy of that PDF file to a thumb drive, to a USB thumb drive, and carry that down to the library. And that's how you get the image of this family tree to the library. Other things to mention, once you print it at the library, it's on paper, which is lovely and that may be as far as you want to take it. The next option, the next step beyond that is, well, I want to get it matted to some sort of a stiff backer board, maybe a foam board or, or a matting board glued to that. That is, again, a whole other chapter of this process. I, when I've presented these professionally and, and given them to people professionally, um, Sometimes I skip the foam board because it, it, it takes hours of time to do. Um, sometimes you want to have it mounted to a foam board or you want to have it behind a, a glass frame so people don't put their fingers on top of it. Getting it framed again is a, a long, expensive process. You can look up um, on the internet in um, YouTube. There are several videos on spray glue mounting pictures to foam board, follow those. There are different methods. The, the danger, of course, is, is getting overspray on top of your picture or getting bubbles underneath your picture between the picture and the foam board. It is a, a long process, but it can be done. I've done it several times. Um, picture framing, expensive again. <laughs> um, go to a thrift store and find a used frame somewhere with an existing inexpensive picture in it that you don't mind throwing away and uh, reuse that frame for your family tree. It is far more affordable that way. And that pretty well caps up everything. Just as a summary, the purpose of this is to give you an achievable goal. We do genealogical research to, of course, find out about our ancestors, to enjoy the chase and the puzzlement of it all. Maybe though it comes down to we want to leave something behind or we want to share something. This is a way of leaving something behind or sharing something. It's an achievable goal. It is something you can do using Legacy Family Tree. It's not that terribly expensive, $35 to purchase the software. I think you would enjoy the overall process of it. It is a uh, reiterative process. You want to repeat it. You want to refine it. You want to get better pictures, maybe better text. Um, be patient with it. Enjoy the process. You will come out with a beautiful chart at the end that you can take to the library and print. And then give as a gift to somebody, whether it's somebody special in your family, your mother, your dad, your children, 
hey children, here's our family tree. Maybe somebody in the town that is very special that you want to produce a family tree chart for. I did that for one of the mayors of Arlington. Um, it is a great presentation, a great way to honor some people. So I hope this works for you. I do think it's an achievable goal. And I uh, thank you for attending this class. This is Paul Wilkinson, and I wish you the very best.